because the university's architecture department hosts a small section called the Centre for Sustainable Architecture with Wood, Seesaw. So I ended up working at Seesaw as one of the technicians and one of the projects that came up was looking at discoloration of Tasmanian blackwood, specifically the chemical nature of the stains and how they came about. Anyway, I'll run you through it. Um, as it says there, my primary supervisor is Dr Mark Dewsbury. I've also got co-supervisors, Dr Kyra Wood and Professor Brett Paul, who's in chemistry. Anyway, moving on. So, point that way. Okay, so, any study into timber and its uses has to take into account the sustainability of timber as a material. So, the very definition of sustainability is the ability to sustainably ensure, yeah, has to, Humanity has the ability to make development sustainable to ensure that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It's the core definition that was defined by the 1984 Brundtland Report to the United Nations. And it's been modified just slightly by people who have come subsequently to that. But the core sustainability is all about that. Now, in this day and age, building is, and operation of buildings accounts for nearly 40% of all of humanity's carbon emissions. It's a real problem for the environment. So we have a, a responsibility, therefore, to make sure that we build more with sustainable products. And the most sustainable product we have is wood. We should be building more with wood. However, timber, wood, etc., is a natural material. Inherently to all timber and natural products is the fact that it's going to have defects deviations and all these little problems that come from processing of natural materials. So, where do, we, where do we stand with that? You've got to make sure that it's all processed properly and appropriately and try and make it as free from defect as possible. So, oh, too far. Right, there we go. Okay, so one of the problems that we are experiencing in Tasmania, primarily with Blackwood, is the fact that a lot of it is being processed and it's coming out discoloured. Now this is not a problem which is unique to Tasmania. Discoloration of timber happens worldwide for all sorts of reasons and there's so many different ways that it can happen. So here's a quick sum up of all of the different ways that it can happen. So you can have resin exudation, light induced discoloration, non-organic chemicals, enzymatic, non-enzymatic, fungal and bio and other bacterial causes. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> But it's uniquely specific to every different situation, every single different timber that gets dried. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach by its very nature. Anyway, what are we facing in Tasmania at the moment? Blackwood. Blackwood is currently um, experiencing problems. What is blackwood? I'm assuming most of us know what it is. It's a timber which has been used since time began in Australia. And if the, the thing is, it's not just unique to Tasmania. You can see from up, up on the right there, the distribution is all down the eastern seaboard of Australia and up through to South Australia. We call it Tasmanian blackwood, but as was mentioned, on the mainland they call it other things. There's about 20 different names for it, depending on where you are in Australia. It's a beautiful timber. And it's almost uniquely used for its visual properties. So... You can see down the bottom, bottom right there, some of the best blackwood is all figured and gorgeous and all of the rest of it. But at the top right, you can see mainly it gets used for interior fit-outs. So wall panelling, flooring, furniture, the like. So, currently, Tasmania produces about 10,000 cubic metres per year. And it's all dried in a yard like that. The reason it's dried in a yard like that is because if you put it in a kiln, it distorts, it warps, and it discolours even worse. You can also see that it accounts for a bit, at least 90% currently of the specialty timbers in Tasmania. So what's actually going on? Um, excuse me. Okay, so 
What's been going on is that it turns out that Blackwood's been discolouring for years. But we didn't know about it because Blackwood was always sold rough cut. So the discoloration in many cases goes beneath the surface. So you can't see it until it actually gets planed down. Recently, architects and furniture people have been saying, we need to actually see what's going on. So they've started to plane it before sailing, before selling it. Um, and the main type of discoloration that is being seen is a banded discoloration. You can see with these examples here, there, there. Right. Where the lines are. That's, that's currently what's going on. And it's, the extent of the discoloration is such that about 30% of the stock is affected by it. So what's going on? Because it's so regular, it's not natural. It's not being caused by the tree itself and the way the tree's growing. It's being caused by something that's happening during the drying process. So the total cost of Tasmanian industry is about six figures. So it's in the million dollar range. Several million dollars, in fact. <clears throat> so recently, about the time when I started, it was the subject of a NIFB grant, so the um, National Forest Products Institute grant, which was basically what funded the initial part of my, my PhD. Why is that? Excuse me, technical problems. OK, so what's going on? Blackwood is dried, as I said, in racks outside. So when they construct the racks of timber, what they do is they make layers of it, which are separated by what are called sticks. Really technical. <laughs> I bet they thought it, it took them all night to think that one up. So <clears throat> the sticks enable air flow through the racks of timber, which allows moisture to ev evaporate out. Um, the materials they use for the sticker is usually the same as the timber that's being dried in the racks or timber that's very similar. Um, following the drying, the timber is then surface docked, graded and packed, and the surfacing allows them to see any defects which they can then cut out and get rid of, which is when the discoloration gets noticed. So, what I've been doing to this, for the start of my study, what I wanted to know is where is it happening? Why is it happening and where is it happening? And that's the, that's the initial thing to find out. So looking at the overall data, so I sat there at the end of a production line and watched every single board. 10,000 boards <laughs> went past my eyes and I evaluated every single one. Which rack was it in? Where had those, where is the, where had those racks come from? What part of the rack was it in? So you can see every single board had an alphanumeric designator on the end of it. So I can say A1, that's right up the top left corner. If I get 30 A1s, that means that one's really, that position in the rack is really heavily discoloured. <coughs> okay, so it involved all of these data points, plus quite a few extras, which I'm still collating. So where it was milled, when it was milled, how long the logs were stored before milling, which is an important one, dimensions of the timber itself, drying duration per rack, and then site level data, position of each rack in the drying yard, vertical position of each rack, because they stack them up. So airflow over the top is much greater than it is at the ground. Ends of rows get more airflow. Is that a factor? I'm still working that one out. Then rack level data, position of the board in each rack, orientation. It was the board upside down or right side up? Which side has actually got the discoloration? And then discoloration amount per board. So 
what I found from the RAC survey initially was that there wasn't just one type of stain happening. There was five. <laughs> and each of them showed up in different spots <clears throat> and under different circumstances. Some of them were showing up in the middle of the racks. Some of them were showing up on the outside of the racks, top and bottom, and on the outsides, whereas the middle was completely unaffected. The two most common types of discoloration that I came up with <clears throat> were the dark discoloration, which went, meant that where the stickers were, there was a dark stripe. And that dark stripe went all the way through the board because I took some, a number of boards and I planed them down and I planed them down and all the way through the boards, no matter how much I cut off the board, it was still there. The mills knew about this. They were, they were warning me about it. But you can't get rid of that. Okay. So that was in about 5 to 15% of the total rack population. The second type of discoloration was the one down the bottom that you can see on the right there. And that was, initially, this was funny. They came to me and said, we've got light discoloration. It's all going light underneath where the sticks are. So I sat there and watched the 10,000 boards going through. And I'm going, that's not light. <laughs> that's going dark where the sticker isn't. Away from the stickers is where it's going dark. And you can look at, it, look at that. And then the diagram underneath indicates exactly what's going on. So for that one, they can salvage the, some of the timber because it only happens on about the top five millimetres of the timber. So they can plane that five millimetres off. However, that takes a significant amount of effort, staff, power and, yeah, money, basically. So as a result, the timber becomes much more valuable. Pain in the backside for them. Anyway, as, while I was doing all of this, the chemistry department were also having a look at what's going on with the chemistry. And the final results are in. The, chemi chemi the chemicals are present and they're different from where the, the stain is from where it isn't. Really? <laughs> Sorry. Completely, completely expected. The other thing they were postulating was that the rack, racks down the bottom were going to get much more discoloured than the ones at the top. They thought it was going to be squashing the timber. After doing the analysis, not, that's not the case. Anyway. So... Out of all of the data that I collected, so you can see down the bottom left, those are all the dimensions that came out. So the three thicknesses that get cut are 25 mil thick, 38 mil thick, and 50 mil thick. So essentially it's one inch, one and a half, and two inches. So, what's, what, yeah, where do you go with that one? <clears throat> and that's, this is going to be the next stage, which is doing the data analysis, and I'm part way through that already. But you can see on the right hand side, there's a pair plot. And what a pair plot does is plot a whole bunch of factors against themselves. So you can see the, the line going down the middle shows, instead of a bunch of dots, a distribution, which is a vertical thing. If you follow that column down, it'll give you which, what that distribution is of. And a correlation is where you get a straight line of dots. Anyway, there are a couple of immediate correlations in there, but I'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> so... The first one that jumps out is that <clears throat> there's a slight deviation for every season. So there's a seasonal deviation. The amount of evaporation is, that is coming off the board, by its very nature, is going to be related to the temperature and humidity that it's experiencing. So that tells me that when it's summer, you're going to have more evaporation and you're going to get more discoloration. Why? I'm not sure. I want, to, I want to model that and I want to find out what's going on. The other one is that there is a correlation between thickness and the width, the actual dimensions of the board, but that one's a cheesy one as well and I'm not sure what's going on. All of that comes out and I don't really know much yet because I'm still in the study. <laughs> I'm still learning things. There are a whole bunch, there's about seven or eight immediate factors and I haven't gone through all about 20 factors that I showed you there. But what's really interesting is the way that they used to dry blackwood 150 years ago. They used to dry it stook style. And you can see on the left here, this is a photo from Britain's Swamp in the northwest of Tasmania. And they used to dry it vertically with one contact point up the top and one co contact point where it hit the ground. <clears throat> There's no record of any discoloration from that period at all. Anyway, there's... The unfortunate bit is there that they were drying small quantities. We can't go through that now because 10,000 cubic metres, which 
Can you imagine someone carrying around a stick? <laughs> These days it has to be done in racks because that's, it's part of the volume equation. So what else can you do? The implicated immediately, as I've said, is the temperature and humidity and the airflow. So what they're trying at the moment is they're trying to maximise the airflow by using contoured stickers. <clears throat> but it's not fixing the problem. They're using these polycarbonate sticks in between layers of timbers. Yeah. <laughs> they're using polycarbonate stickers to try and maximise the amount of airflow and the amount of evaporation. But it's not working either. It's having an effect, but it's not completely eliminating. I'm not sure it's something that can be completely eliminated at all, given the current methods. But, we, but the next step for me is to try and model the temperature and humidity conditions to try and find out where the worst is happening. And then we can go back to them and say, this is where the worst is happening, and this is where the best of it's happening. You need to do more of what, what, what's going on with the best of it. You need to replicate those conditions in order to do that. But the next step for me is, I'm still going through literature. Um, the next step for me, though, is to evaluate other software in order to try and model what's going on. Because we know because of the moisture and humidity and heat, the hygrothermal factors, that that's modelable. We can say, if, if we can actually put it in a piece of software and, and replicate the results that I've seen from my rack surveys, I can then go back and actually model it and predict what the best outcomes are going to be for them. And essentially, that's where I'm at now. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? All studies have faults. Absolutely. What strikes me as the biggest fault with what you've got. And are you able to attend to that somehow? You're asking what the biggest fault is? Yep. And what you might be able to biggest fault at the moment is the short duration of this study because the RAC survey was done over a one-year period. As a result of that, I can't take into account multi-year climatic variation. Um, and the biggest way I can actually get around that is to use the modelling software and try and say, you know, last year, how was, it, how was the overall discoloration? I have to take a holistic approach. Um, there are a few other <laughs> less pressing issues, but that was the main one. Uh, <clears throat> how much of the discoloration is caused just by the differences in heat and temperature, or is it caused by bacterial or fungal growth? Okay. In concert with the chemical analysis, there was bacterial and fungal analysis. Nothing. Nothing at all. Anyone else? Hello, good afternoon. Yeah, I'm uh, Jack Tan here from Singapore. Uh, thanks for coming to our presentation today. I've uh, just completed um, my PhD uh, second year in June this year, so I'm starting my second month uh, in my third year. So uh, my supervisors are Dr. Mark uh, Dewsbury and Philippa Watson. If anyone in the audience lived in a house that was built uh, before uh, 2003, uh, you, uh, you might find my presentation today interesting. There are three parts to my presentation. The first part is on the backgrounds uh, of older housing, their energy rating and challenges uh, relating to thermal comfort. The second part is about the methods and uh, some key findings uh, of uh, old dwellings when retrofitting them. The third part is on my next steps uh, uh, of my current research. Uh, my research is not to advise people how they should live their life, but is aiming to provide guidance uh, to the architectural problems and to the government about the methods and the risk uh, when uh, trying, to Im uh, trying to improve the older uh, dwellings. In Australia, there are over 9.9 .9 million dwellings 
of which 73 are detached ones. Almost 7 million homes were built uh, before the national energy efficiency regulations came into place in 2003. These older homes are of uh, very significant concern because not only they consume uh, more than 30% of all energy uh, uh, in the nation, but their poor quality building envelopes are likely, uh, are likely uh, energy inefficient, costly to run and unhealthy to live in. Many of such homes, especially in uh, uh, the southern Australia, are timber framed dwellings from CSIRO uh, records collected since 2016. The largest dwelling types in Tasmania is timber clad at uh, 32%. So my, presenta my presentation today will focus on these uh, dwelling types, but its methods and the findings um, are relevant to the other dwellings too. Uh, some background information, um, yeah. The new dwellings energy performance are currently benchmarked uh, uh, using the NETA scheme, which stands for uh, Australia's Nationwide House Energy Rating Scheme. Uh, this was implemented in 2003. A house rated one star under these schemes offer little protection against uh, the climate condition it is located and will need a very significant energy to maintain its uh, thermal comfort. A house rated 10 star on uh, this benchmark can support thermal comfort with little to no energy required. In most states, uh, Natus currently supports 3 star uh, since 2010 for new dwellings and the seven star requirements will be implemented sometime this year 2022 however that there are currently fewer requirements for older dwellings built before 2004 many of these older homes are between 1.2 to 1.5 stars uh, it has also been found in a study that 75 of such homes are either too costly to heat or not comfortable uh, uh, during winter. The challenge is to understand and support uh, uh, the action uh, for improving them uh, with advanced tools, which I'll share with you uh, uh, in the next uh, few slides. The overall aim of my PhD proposal is therefore to understand the uh, optimum indoor and uh, environmental qualities for older homes in the south of, uh, uh, of Australia. This has both local and international relevance as shown in the slides of these countries that shares a uh, very, sim uh, very similar Copen temperature and, uh, sorry, uh, to sh that share similar Copen uh, climate uh, classification as uh, Tasmania. So the climate classification uh, that, I'm, uh, that I am looking at is CFB cl uh, climate. Um, studies have shown that our climate condition uh, often impacts living things. The study of uh, insects and flies have shown that temperature changes impact their growth rates, size and, e and even pigmentation on their wings. This phenomena is not a direct result of the original genetic makeup of these creatures. In humans, our core temperature uh, fluctuates to, with changes in ambient uh, temperature. It's, it, the, our core temperature will shrink in uh, cooler temperature and expands in warmer ones, as you can see in the slide. A study conducted in Holland on eight adults uh, aged 22 to 25 and comparing with eight um, older people 
uh, aged between 67 to 73 years old, they are subjected to, uh, to the indoor temperature difference of between 17 to 25 degrees Celsius. It is found that older people often prefer warmer temperature. The older subjects' uh, fingertips showed larger temperature differences to the underarm uh, temperatures when compared to the younger subjects. Productivity, which is our, connecti uh, our cognitive function, is however not, impact not impacted if indoor temperature is kept at around 17 to 25 degrees Celsius and if temperature fluctuation is also kept within uh, 2 Kelvin per hour change. Many such studies have been conducted to understand thermal comfort. The ones shown here are just uh, one of the many. Note that thermal comfort is also impacted by the clothing worn, the, acti the activity of the person, and also the air speed in the room. And this, in turn, will finally uh, impact on the preferred uh, range of temperature. There are two questions to my research. The first is, concern, uh, is concerning the current green rating tools and the methods they are used to, um, uh, to inform decision-making um, process. 17 to 20 uh, green rating tools were surveyed and looked at. Um, this includes local and international ones to understand how they access our environment. The second question concerns how retrofit provisions can support higher quality indoor environments for older dwellings. The methods shown in this slide can be grouped into four parts. The first method explores the indoor, uh, uh, indoor and environmental qualities and how the green rating tools measures them. The second method surveys and extracts typical dwelling types for analysis. These are one, two, three, and four uh, bedroom dwellings. The third and fourth methods are then developed to access thermal comfort and uh, the hydrothermal performance of the retrofit options, uh, which I will show in the later slide. Both document analysis and simulations are used for this method. We had quite a journey to get to this next slide to extract the dwelling types that best represent uh, the older housing stock in Australia. So uh, we look at multiple data sources, uh, uh, like the archive in Tasmania, books and plans, to have an understanding of the most realistic uh, plans to put into uh, the simulation. The houses we looked at uh, were built from 1940s to the, uh, to the early 2000s that were most typical. Uh, shown here are the one, two, three to four bedrooms. Uh, we, we include the open plan and the in, internal uh, uh, layout uh, corridors type. These layout plans with uh, the building components, the, the thickness, the floors, the windows, and the roof were input into the computer with uh, four variations and uh, around uh, four other variations of window floor ratios. Uh, window floor ratios uh, shown on the slides are to express the proportion of uh, windows in relation to the floor area. A higher window floor ratio means that there are more windows compared to one with a lower window floor ratio. Uh, computer simulation were carried out on all the four orientations to mimic the uh, different conditions. Uh, of such dwellings uh, in, the real, uh, in the real world. Uh, three cities of Tasmania were chosen in the studies. Uh, they are Devonport, Tasmania, uh, sorry, Devonport, uh, Launceston, and Hobart. 
due to time uh, reasons, I will only show some of the key findings of the research thus far. The first one is that uh, the local and international green rating tools covers a multitude of green issues other than the um, indoor and uh, environmental qualities. Uh, on the top row of the slides, you could see the typical uh, green issues area. They include things like the safety of materials, the quality of uh, water, waste management, and so on. The review of 17 of these tools, I hope the slides is not too small. You could see it uh, at the bottom row there. Uh, shows that uh, energy efficiency and indoor environmental qualities are the primary focus of most of these tools. So this is uh, represented by the green line in the, the um, middle of the graph. So the percentage weighting of these two categories ranges from uh, around 40 to 60 percent of the total credits, which is quite a, a, a large number. Uh, confirming the importance of um, the indoor environmental quality and energy in the overall scheme of things. However, among these green rating tools, there are differences in emphasis on green issues for example, um, Nethers, uh, which is an Australian tool uh, seen on the right here, uh, the focus is more on energy use in maintaining uh, thermal comfort. While, while the tools from the USA like LEED homes and well standards attach uh, uh, more significance to construction management and post-occupancy assessment. This next slide shows uh, the findings of uninsulated dwellings, which are rated around um, 1.2 to 1.8 stars. Uh, it includes the findings for the smaller and the, the, the larger dwelling types in uh, Devonport, Launceston and Hobart. Uh, two, the two takeaways is that uh, we are not seeing uh, any of the dwellings that would have more than two stars rating. The second uh, takeaway is that although the smaller uh, dwellings are rated the same rating as the larger ones, the larger dwellings actually will consume more energy because uh, the energy the energy rating system in Australia is based on per meter square, meaning that uh, uh, dwelling size that is uh, uh, that is 100 meters square would consume half uh, the energy compared to another one which is rated the same star rating but bigger, uh, say uh, 200 meter square. The next finding is that um, the window floor ratios, uh, which is the amount of windows on a facade of a building, is an important consideration for uh, thermal comfort. In this graph, uh, but this graph is to show the results of low-grade 1.2 star uh, uh, three-bedroom dwellings. I'm still running simulations for the higher star um, uh, dwellings to draw, con uh, to draw the conclusions. But uh, for now, uh, we can see that on the graph top row for dwellings, dwellings with, uh, uh, with internal corridors, and the uh, bottom one is for the open plan uh, uh, dwellings. Uh, you can see a slight increase in uh, the energy consumption as the uh, as the window uh, wall ratios get larger. Sorry, it's not working. It, it's not working. Sorry, it's a very slight one. 
Uh, you can see the little slope at the top bar there and there. Because from, from the left here, it, uh, uh, the window wall ratios are small, so lesser windows and more window screen. And you can see the so these are the same count plans that were simulated. Uh, there seems to be a sweet spot for uh, the amount of windows for dwellings for thermal comfort is between 26% to 31%. Uh, you can see from the circled um, um, points on the graph, this is to highlight that uh, when the windows get lesser, which is for here for the top or get bigger here, the logic uh, may not work in certain uh, climatic condition and certain shapes of uh, dwellings. So the sweet, pot, uh, sweet spot is between 26% to 31% for window wall, window floor ratio. For, air, um, uh, for the air tightness, uh, older dwellings are very leaky. Their air change rate is typically around uh, 30 air change per hour, meaning that the volume, the entire volume of air in the dwelling would change 30 times every hour. That's the typical uh, leakiness. Um, uh, this data was measured by CSIRO. Uh, compared to new homes, um, the requirement is that the air change rate per hour should not be more than 10. So when an older building become more airtight, as seen on the graph on the top row left, uh, there's a tightening from the air change rate of 30 right down to 0 0.6 air change per hour. You could see the correlation with the energy consumption, it drops down, the bar drops. Um, Okay, the next graph that you can see over there uh, on the top row on the right is to uh, analyze whether uh, this uh, impact of tightening of building is the same across uh, different parts of uh, uh, Tasmania. And the answer is no. Uh, the same house that is built in uh, Devonport orientated the same direction would perform differently. And the reason uh, correlates to the wind condition of the slide, as you can see at the bottom row here. So a windier uh, condition like in Devonport, which has the highest uh, wind condition expressed by the spikes of blue in the uh, uh, graph at the bottom, the energy efficiency gets better when th those older dwellings are tightened compared to uh, its impact in Launceston or Hobart, as seen in that uh, top right-hand slide. The improvement of air tightening ranges from 10% um, of, of energy improvement to 7% for uh, um, Launceston and Hobart. Uh, one of my uh, PhD methods is to develop retrofit details for floor ceilings and uh, windows. Shown here are some of them. Uh, the, uh, this is to improve the dwellings uh, uh, that are around 1.5 star and see their impact as uh, the retrofit details are implemented for the higher star rating, which is six stars, the current rating to match, to bring the, uh, the, the older homes up to six star and to understand the implication. At, and then the next step is to bring them up to, to, to eight stars and to understand the implication of uh, the energy and the movement of moisture through the building components as the uh, star rating gets uh, um, higher. 
Uh, the details developed uh, also takes into consideration that uh, construction could be carried out from the internal or, or the external of the buildings. That's why there are uh, different variations for wall details, uh, particularly for wall uh, details. These are the external wall uh, details. And note the 3D uh, diagram here. Uh, most of you might not have seen how uh, modern homes looks like in the cross section. Uh, this is just a picture. So on uh, the uh, external part, uh, we have the timber boards here. And then we have the timber frame. Behind it is the membrane to control the moisture moving in and out of the building. All right, this slide shows the uh, readings. Uh, more than 900 simulations in total were conducted thus far. These are just some of them due to time uh, reasons. So the three take, uh, take away is that uh, early and small improvements are worth it. Uh, even small adjustment to the building envelope, the, uh, these measures would help. For example, uh, if cost is not a concern, uh, replacing windows to a double glazing one would improve uh, uh, the older dwelling, uh, the energy rating by close to 10 percent. Yeah. But it's only able to bring maximum. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, th this is only able to bring the rating, uh, the star rating up to 1.4 to 1.6, which is still quite low. So in terms of strategy. on the ceiling. So that could immediately bring uh, the star rating to 3 to 3.2 star. That represents close to a 50% savings of total fuel power. Yeah. And if you want to take <coughs> the next step, uh, it's shown in the slides here, I group it into the lower retrofit and the higher one. So the upgrading of windows or ceiling with floors. If it's just for ceiling with floors, it would reach close to a four star uh, dwelling and uh, the fuel savings is close to 50%. And if any household has the uh, energy and the courage to do a high retrofit by involving the external uh, facade, one could almost reach up to a nine-star house, which is way above the current uh, benchmarks for for new 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 uh, uh, dwellings. But it's possible, but there are risks uh, doing it. Uh, I will not share the risks at uh, today's presentation due to the lack of time. But my uh, next uh, uh, steps for my PhD uh, research is to use uh, the details that I've shown to you and to run it through a hydrothermal uh, computer simulation to understand the movements of um, moisture as well as heat through, through the uh, section of a building. So what you're seeing here is a cross-section of that timber facade that, uh, that uh, was shown earlier. So in here, this, this side uh, is the outdoor, uh, the outdoor and that end is the indoor, um, uh, uh, the indoor condition. So the latest, uh, the latest advanced software is able to simulate throughout uh, the seasons, the whole year, and even up to 10 years, how this building facade will perform by uh, creating, uh, 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 sorry, by overlapping the uh, weather files, which Freya later on would uh, go through. 
uh, to simulate the condition of it as it happened. So um, if I may, this is an overlap of that software. What we are looking at is actually two parts here. One uh, is circled on the top right here. You can see that uh, when I'm running the simulation, let me do it. Sorry, the software is supposed to run a simulation. Technical glitch. Um, so th the software is trying to simulate the condition of the outdoor sphere. So, so this graph would go up and down here to show the simulation throughout the system. And we are trying to keep uh, indoor temperature here according to the Nestle standard, which is the Australian standard of uh, 20 degrees. And in here, we are looking at the two things, the accumulation of uh, water on the facade here. So there's two glass here. And here is the uh, moisture that we collect. Uh, the simulation doesn't work apparently. So we are, we are trying to see through the material the moisture that is collected at the relative humidity of 70%, even right up to 100%. The reason being that more growth starts when R H is 70 and above. And uh, software would run through, uh, through a duration of 10 years. So uh, we have the option of uh, inputting when we want the uh, climate to start. It could be for a project that is built, say, uh, two years from now, we, we could tell the computer that uh, uh, do the simulation from 2024 to 2034, for example. And the results, this is a section that was done for that wall that you see. Uh, this is a snapshot through the material, that uh, building material, is able to give an indication here that uh, the more growth index, uh, according to international standards in Europe and in the States, the benchmark is uh, three. So anything above three is like a fail. So in here, it's showing that in the duration, this building will be built uh, in the fourth quarter of that the uh, CTLA uh, 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 fails in terms of uh, moisture control uh, through the skin of the building. Thank you. That's, that's all for the presentation. Mold control, um, yeah. retrofitting yep. for mold control. Um, can you expand a little bit about what you can think can be done there? Okay. I noted the point about the wall membranes. What beyond that? Because okay. it's currently a pretty hot topic for public yep. housing. Yeah, the key is actually to allow the uh, moisture and the vapor to get out of the house. Uh, for example, in winter, the temperature here would be around uh, let's say 20 degrees. So outside may be zero. So warm air here uh, would hold more moisture. So it's trying to leave the skin of the building. So but it's blocked by the characteristic and the properties of the facade. So in this case, uh, which the simulation just now did not work, uh, 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 we would be able to see. 
to, to look at this membrane here that has the property to allow uh, moisture to go through the skin. Because uh, in this detail that, that I, I want to show uh, uh, the audience is that the permeability of this skin here is too tight. It's not uh, letting the moisture out. So uh, the, permea uh, the permeability of the construction material is uh, crucial as uh, uh, one's retrofit uh, building to a, to a higher grade one. Uh, does this answer your question? I assume other construction methods apart from the ones you're examining you might have more problems. Okay, I, uh, yeah, I want to... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Australia has uh, is slightly behind places like America, Europe. Uh, last year in UK, they have, uh, uh, have a standard that is uh, uh, rolled out to the public. It's called uh, PAS, PAS 2035. So that uh, standard actually is written to uh, specifically for existing dwellings in, in, in UK. So it has identified a lot of risks through the use of the material, what one has to do and one can't do. Because building science is actually quite complex. The, uh, this is only one aspect of the building scheme. The, the other one which is tied into is uh, the mechanical system or the cooling system that is used to heat and cool. So we look at it uh, uh, from both uh, perspectives because uh, improving one of these, let's say the skin, uh, may not uh, actually give you the results you want because the equipment that is running the house may not be designed for that space. So it's slightly more complex than looking at just the insulation or the windows. Uh, I'm highlighting the UK standard, UK, uh, PAS PAS 2035, uh, as a guide to the audience that, uh, that, that you can look at it if you uh, want to understand deeper understanding of retrofitting risks. Any question? Some of your diagrams are associated with Tasmania and we don't need to know anything about what's happening in the United Kingdom. Because we're not in the United Kingdom, we're in Tasmania. And any, this, you're not the only way, person, mate. Everybody or many, many people relates to America or Tasmania or England and we're only interested in Launceston Devonport, Launceston and Hobart. Yeah. And so, it, I know it's mild criticism, but you, you've got to learn the same as what we have to learn too. Now, I at home had a home built uh, 18 years ago and I've never turned the heat pump on because it's not necessary because the house is so well insulated. Mm. Now, the me men who've done it knew what they were doing. And I constantly hear people having to turn a heat pump on and it costs so much money. Well, if it's cold, I go to bed with a heat pump with an electric blanket and, and three or four blankets. So why have a run a heat pump when you don't need to? But I thank you for your time. Do you have a do you want me to answer yeah? Do you have a, a comment regarding? I just want to say that uh, yeah, I know what you uh, pointed out is true. So uh, if you have seen my my slides, uh, this uh, PhD study is specific for southern part of Australia. But as all people who likes uh, knowledge and science, we built on what other people are doing in the rest of the part of the world, uh, e e regardless of nationality or. Um, uh, differences in our, uh, social values. So we are looking at knowledge and science. So the uh, uh, Copen climate that I've shown, the data it shows that there are similarities, not completely uh, similar, but there are similar lessons that we can learn from our fellow uh, uh, scientists and human beings. Yeah, but, but it has to be specific uh, later on to, 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 uh, for the context which is what this PhD is about.
Um, I endured that a lot. I am the owner of a 1948 house, so you can imagine the issues I'm facing during the climate over the year. Um, to have done the study without looking at what was happening elsewhere in the world would have been far too narrow-minded and um, it really d did need to pull on existing um, information coming from elsewhere, so I applaud you for that and uh, I'm sorry, I disagree with you and I totally agree with you that we need to be looking at what's happening overseas as well because what we're talking about is climate, not culture, yeah. well, unless, unless culture impacts on the way that houses are built. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, but I do understand this uh, gentleman's uh, consent. Yeah, because, uh, yeah. yeah, but I know what you're thinking. Launceston comes out very poorly, yeah. I thought, in, in the study. Um, we also had the ongoing issue of wood smoke yeah. that floated over the city like a blanket. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, actually, slides to show, uh, to show studies done to, um, um, uh, to hit homes uh, in all the states of Australia. That would take me some time to, to, to take it out, but uh, if you have time, I can show it to you. The... Um, I'm trying to find a, a politically correct word to use. The, <laughs> so I'm stumbled. It's, it's ironic that Tasmania has hydro uh, uh, power, but actually the uh, energy used to heat homes, I think the statistic shows that uh, around 50% were from the firewood. So the other, my PhD is not in that direction, but it has implication in a sense that if Perhaps if we move to uh, better rated star, uh, uh, rated houses, the, this uh, proportion of using firewood could, 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 uh, could be addressed. Maybe, but that's not my area of uh, uh, research. But I understand on what you, were, uh, uh, what you have highlighted on uh, the sources of energy uh, use. <coughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> After much ado, I am here to talk to you about black mould. <laughs> okay, so we all have no doubt that mould can impact humans in our society. Um, our health can be impacted, we can get headaches, respiratory diseases, skin conditions, the whole lot. And it also destroys houses. It starts attacking the structure of the house. The mould gets in and it starts rotting it. Just like putting your house on a compost heap, eventually it's going to go sideways and end up as rubbish on the side of the road. Now, I know that um, mould is on the mind of many people here in Tassie. Hands up. Who thinks about mould? I like to see how many people actually are thinking about mould because if you are, you probably have it in your house to some degree. Right, I am going back to high school physics. So we have different states of matter. We have solid, liquid and gas. We're looking at water this time. So Solid water is ice, liquid is the stuff you drink, and gas is water vapour. And it's measured in humidity, relative humidity or absolute humidity. So what I do is um, simulations, hydrothermal simulations. So Jack introduced um, some slides that showed some hydrothermal simulations. Now, my presentation isn't as technical as my colleagues, but um, I'm going to try and explain it to you in a more um, layperson's um, 
um, way. So I re will refer to these simulations as mould and condensation simulations. So these simulations will show you how mould develops in houses within the wall, the structure of the house, and also on the surfaces on the inside and the outside. Um, so, we, um, I was actually quite surprised when I first started this PhD. I didn't know that you could actually have mould without liquid water. If you just have enough humidity in the air, which is water vapour in the air, gaseous form of water, then you're going to get mould at a certain temperature. So, at 70 relative humidity, as Jack pointed out, you're going to get mould at certain temperatures. And this could actually be mould on surfaces that you can see and also surfaces you cannot see. So by the time you see condensation on your wall, it's already too late. It's actually growing somewhere within your wall and most likely at the place on the edge of the insulation where it gets the coldest. So that's where the wrap is the building wrap, the blue paper. Or if you've got a newer house, it's the, 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 the membrane that's supposed to be vapour permeable. More on that later. So, I've got a little graph here. Only one graph, I promise. Um, condensation and mould simulations need rain data in them. We've got international studies that show that um, rain data is very important in simulating condensation and mould. If we don't have it, then we can actually underestimate how much condensation happens. So if we look at this graph, um, I've confirmed this in the Australian context, so I use Melbourne um, as an example. So this is a graph showing condensation in a wall over 12 months um, in Melbourne, and the wall is a brick veneer wall. Um, so if you look at the red down the bottom, I'm going to try this out. Woo! Okay, that red down the bottom. You can't see the, you probably can't see this, this um, axis here, but um, it peaks at about one kilogram per cubic metre. And this is at the insulation layer. So there's water forming in there. That is run on a simulation with climate data without rain. So it's um, one cubic, one kilo, kilogram per cubic metre. But if I, I run a simulation by adding rain, you can actually see these wild fluctuations where the rain is actually coming against the building and the wind is driving the rain into the building. So um, it actually peaks at about 10.5 kilograms per cubic metre which means it's a whopping 10 times more than um, the simulation without the rain. So why don't we always um, simulate with rain data? In our simulations for um, mould and condensation, um, we can actually put any sort of data in there. So what, what's happened, we're going to go park back a little bit, we're going to backpedal a little bit to the 1970s where energy efficiency simulations um, here, yeah, this one, this one, um, they don't need rain data. So climate data was, was not created with rain. Now, we've inherited this rain, this climate data without the rain, and we can plug them straight into this um, mould and condensation simulation, but we get false results, but it doesn't give us any warnings. We can just put any sort of data in there and spit something out, and we can assume that that is the correct result. But that's not the case. Now, why, why are we using that instead of just adding rain? Well, that's because our um, climate data for energy simulations is regulated. It's easy to get. 
And it's in familiar climate zones that are, um, that are um, looked after or administered by NATHERS. So it's familiar for people who are doing energy simulations. When they do a mould and condensation simulation, they can just use the same data file. Easy. But that is not going to work for a, an accurate um, simulation of water, vapour and water in a bu building. So the consequences are that you're underestimating how much condensation and mould is in a house. You're expecting a dry house if you use that design that you, you um, put into the simulation program. But in reality, you're going to get a mould and wet building. So um, does it matter? Our building regulations are climate specific. So we've got um, different regulations with different parts of Australia. Here in Launceston, building regulations require more insulation than say somewhere in um, other parts like in Darwin. That's Darwin. <laughs> um, and because of that, um, and because they're climate specific, we can't keep building buildings in different climate zones and then testing all of them. It's just going to be too expensive. Not only are you building one building in each climate zone, but you have to build different types of buildings. So brick veneer wall building in climate zone A all the way up to 60 plus climate zones here in Australia. So as you can understand, this is just going to be too expensive for us. So science comes to the rescue. We rely on science to show us how um, we can um, build um, for resilient homes. So we have, um, um, I've lost here, okay. So we test all the buildings in simulations and because of that, we need to be sure that all our inputs to our simulations are accurate so we can get accurate results. Now I'm going to move on to water vapour in the future. When I talk about climate, people think about climate change. And the bottom line is that climate change will increase water vapour in the air. So there are two effects, a local effect and a global effect. Um, and what I want you to take away from this is that the more water vapour is in the air, the more mould will grow, or the potential of mould to grow. So the higher the relative humidity, the higher potential for mould to grow, and also amount or quantity of mould growing. So with a global effect, how many of you notice that in March, Antarctica recorded a temperature of 40 degrees plus their average, long-term average for that day. This is just one small fragment of stacking evidence that shows us our climate and our planet is heating up. So when the, the planet heats up, we're made, made up of mostly ocean. The surface sea temperatures increase, evaporation increases, and then we're going to get more water vapour in the air, which means there's going to be more mould. There's going to be a, a bit of a, a theme happening here, more mould. Oh, I was just going to skip that one. Um, and so local effects. So there's, there's actually two local effects. The, the first local effect is that um, well, one of the reasons why I had to, um, to make sure that um, international um, experiments on um, walls worked here in Australia is that we have a certain vulnerability here in the Southern Hemisphere. There's a higher ocean to land ratio in the Southern Hemisphere. So when the sea temperature rises, and evaporation increases and there's more water vapour, there's more water vapour being produced in the Southern Hemisphere. So I had to actually test that um, the experiments 
conducted in the north was actually applying here in the south. And I did do that in that one graph that I showed you back there. The other thing is um, it can be seen in the La Nina cycle and it's magnified with climate change. We've got higher sea surface temperatures around the Indonesian Sea and that is evaporating at such a high rate that it's producing a lot of water vapour and depositing on the east coast of Australia. And again, more water vapour and more mould. So, um, in conclusion, my PhD in a nutshell, even though I haven't actually gone really deeply into this in um, this talk, I had to actually lead you to this point. Um, my PhD is about um, examining how to add rain data to climate files. It's that fine a point. And so if I were to start off with this, you're going, well, why are you doing it? Well, this is the reason why. I want to make sure that our NCC, which is the National Construction Code, gives us robust guidelines and regulations so that our houses don't end up mouldy in the future. And that's the bottom line. And so to do that, I need to make sure that the climate files going into hydrothermal or mould and condensation simulations are the right ones for our hemisphere, the right ones for Australia. Um, and I'll be doing those by creating different types of files and then testing the results against each other. Thank you. Basically, what you've said is that existing models um, are missing an input, rain data. Yes. Are yes. there other bits of data that strike you as possibly missing from existing models? Um, wind. Um, a lot of the um, hydrothermal or um, rain climate files that I've examined in the um, across the board, they miss wind. When you have wind driving the rain against a facade, say brick or weatherboard, there's gaps and it's going to get into the house somehow. Okay? There's a lot, there's a lot of background. You can read my PhD at some stage if you would like. But um, in Australia, there's no regulation for how much humidity is acceptable inside a house. So we are... In um, other places like America or, the, or over in Europe, it can be like, I think it's 70% is the maximum that is allowed inside homes. And they design for that so that you don't get mould inside the house. So they're a few years ahead of us. And this is why we look to them to see whether we can do, learn from their mistakes. What are they doing? Maybe we can apply it here. But we need to test these things before we just apply them willy-nilly. So. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah? With regard to the um, effect of wind, um, is there likely to be any or suggestion of a uh, change into building rigs to increase the size of overhangs of roof from the, uh, from the walls? Yeah, so within the, um, the mould and simulation programs, you can change how exposed a wall is and whether it's um, under some eaves that come out a certain um, amount um, and also um, whether it's um, on a floor, like an upper or lower floor. It's 
okay. Um, so um, we, we have like a um, provision to simulate whether you're under an eave or not and how far down underneath an eave. So if you're on an upper floor, you're more protected, but then by the time you get down to the bottom floor, if you're in a two-storey, then you're going to get a, a battering of wind and rain on that facade. So that is built into um, the, the simulation so you can actually see what's happening. Did you consider adding the wind data to your study at the time or was it just too big a task to add the both? No, I will be um, uh, assessing a, a whole platter of um, options and that will be one of them. Um, one of the most um, accepted methods is to add um, averages of rain and temperature, but I want to show that it's wind and rain that needs to be um, looked at. And I'll also be looking at extreme weather data as well and creating an extreme climate file rather than the average, because climate is all about averages, right? So we're designing for an average year and repeating that 10 times in our simulations. So I, I would like to um, choose a, say, a La Nina year and simulate that over one year and see what, what happens with that.